So he escaped the gatekeeping. He escaped the gerrymandering structure. And I argue, uh, if you can escape gerrymandering, you know, you can do this. As many accused parties involved with district reform as just scheming to elect more partisan incumbents. You can pre-rig an election by looking at things like voting patterns of the past. You can look at consumption patterns. You can look at the scale of wealth. Um, you can look at organizational participation. Over the past 20 years, these databases have been used to design districts. Most countries have laws where they redraw the districts every 10 years based on population census. It is also an excuse to draw a district that is not going to allow for party competition. And I argue this is a gatekeeping structure that is causing a lot of incumbents to win without having any public approval or very little public approval because other parties can't win in a weird, strange design. I argue you can pre-rate the district. So this fails to create a competitive election and merely divides the opposition artificially into separate districts and stuffs ballots, residences, of one party supporters into one district. You don't need to rig the ballot box. You can rig the district. And this is a real secret to a lot of national history. Uh, Australia is very, very bad at this too. So is New Zealand. Britain has historically done this too. I'm not aware of what Korean districts are and how they're organized. If you're curious, please look that up and post that on the web. What are the laws around the Korean districts? The public can be assured of making stable, nonpartisan, by using stable watersheds as a form of election district. Watersheds, they're biophysically real, they separate different range basins. So they're more competitive. And I argue, since much pollution risk is waterborne, not all, watersheds can represent areas where common environmental risk experiencing exist. People who vote for this party and people who vote for that party now can have a common concern based upon a real biophysical area. Therefore, watershed election districts should be the doable form for feedback into state politics as a publicly desired neutral, nonpartisan way of drawing election boundaries. It has positive effects on party competition by removing gerrymandering to create truly representative parties. All parties are forced to deal with a non-biased district. Parties should compete to represent people's interests, not simply win by default because of gerrymandering. That's one aspect. A second aspect is the material side of locality. I call this commodity ecology. This is an earlier drawing of 71 different kinds of materials. I would argue different local regions need to discover ways of putting waste products into new products that fit the local environment. And this means deciding on what kind of energy fits their local environment best, as well as what kind of recycling would be beneficial. It ranges from things like textiles, dyes and colorants, metals, uh, garbage disposal, drugs and medicines, different kinds of food and crops, Mushroom, I, I, this list has expanded over the years. I once thought 11 was enough, but then I realized over time people choose different things. Money, you know, what is the choice of money in the region? So all these are different ways people choose materials. And if the materials are linked together, I argue this is a vision for sustainability. Another issue is what I call a CDI, which is a civic democratic institution. Maybe in every watershed worldwide, it's not governmental. It's connected to local culture. So whoever people like in a local region, they get recognized. They don't get elected. They just get recognized. And from that cultural body, they can decide to do whatever they want. I also am interested in integrating people in democratic civic participation. This is a natural way of learning about a democratic society from an early age. If you can vote by age 5 and by age 10, be recognized as well as an adult. 
in this area. You can be recognized as doing something good for your region. Um, gender equal representation, because in most areas of the world, there's a gender disparity between environmental issues. Uh, vote for and against. Perhaps there's a lot of people who like someone, and they have a small group around them, but a lot of people don't like them. So you can vote against those people. You don't need to vote for another candidate. You can just vote down. <laughs> a lot of people would just like to vote against people. And I think that should be allowed on the informal level, and you would reduce the vote totals for someone who's very ideological. The outcome, I think, would be a group that is rather culturally accepted, not very radical in either way, but very focused on the local community itself. There's more detail in the book of the voting frameworks about that. So those are the two examples of the small, and now let's talk about the larger areas. Uh, the bi-regional state, you know, the small local nested areas, and abstract national jurisdiction. <coughs> Biracial democracy, or the biracial state, the set of electoral reforms designed to force the political process in a democracy to represent concerns about the economy, the body, and the environmental concerns, like water quality, toward developmental paths that are locally prioritized, like the commodity ecology, and tailored to different areas. You don't need a single future. You need many different regional futures that are equally sustainable. There's not a debate of what will be the next great power revolution or the next great energy revolution, but each region should decide these areas for themselves. Uh, this movement is variously called bi-regional democracy, watershed cooperation, which already occurs between many states of the world that share a border, or you know, other similar names, all of which denote democratic control of a natural commons and local jurisdictional dominance in any economic developmental path decisions while not removing civil rights that are central. So centralized civil rights, but a decentralized economy. That's what I would offer. Would avoid, if you decentralize civil rights, you end up with a lot of ethnic hierarchies and social inequalities. Potentially, I think how different and more locally representative that our normal politics would be simply through these organizational changes. Nothing would change much except the organizations. I will not talk in a great deal right now about these other ideas, proportional representation, the majoritarian allotment, it's a big phrase. It basically means that you can have both a plural number of people elected to a position or a single person. Say a, a district doesn't like any candidate, then if everybody is below 50%, three people are elected, but they only get voting power of their percentage. They only have that much power because the people have only trusted them that much. You don't automatically become the president if you get less than 50%. You can become only a prime minister. That would happen with George Bush, that would happen with Clinton, that would happen with Imo Bach. He would have been a parliamentarian, and the parliament could check his power more than a stable presidential position. That's why I think a flexible executive could apply this. And uh, you need to change the judiciary, the structure of the districts for courts. Courts should also be based on these watershed ideas, too. And uh, I will skip all of this and we need to move forward and talk more about other things. Any comments or questions? We go to the conclusion, one second. Um, this is not a utopia. I'm not arguing for an ideological, central idea. I'm arguing that we don't know and we can't predict. So we need a lot more democratic debate upon a future. That's why I would call this idea a polyutopia. That's multiple real regions, not a single fantasized ideological view. Um, the working definition of the bi-regional state shows a selective sense of autonomy, a polytopia to be maintained. The coin word, 
Polytopia would be a multi-place of real places within a larger polycentric, multi-centric framework of conflict resolution to maintain them as real places, and not a utopia, which is a singular ideological place that exists, which tends to destroy the diversity if it gets into power. Uh, we humans, I argue, because of we have a local ecological interest, we have a politics toward environmental improvement, if we're allowed that to be expressed. Typically, however, this ecological self-interest is shielded in gatekeeping with existing formal institutions and formal policy that only serve an informal elite form of degraded development. However, from polls, a global political demographic force for change is already here, but waiting for organization. Um, if the world is already green, according to many international polls over the past 20 years, we should look carefully at how this greenness is not an ideology. There are right-wing greens, there are left-wing greens, there are anarchist greens, there are very statist greens. My point is, they need to agree to compete, not agree to institute one vision of utopia over another. Attempts to convert this very non-ideological environmental support into a party tends to limit this into a single party vehicle. This is what has happened in the history of any Green Party, where one branch of the parties is successful and it rejects typically a right-wing or a left-wing version. Immediately, when the German Green Party was founded, it split into two groups, because one group wanted to take left-wing ideas and the other group rejected those, but worked locally and became known as the Ecological Democracy Party in Bavaria, in Germany. And both have been very successful, but it has split the movement. That's why I think trying to put green concerns into an ideological process is self-defeating. That's why institutions will help more than a party structure. Of course, I could talk a long, long time.